Good afternoon. Uh, I was told that we should just start uh, slowly here. My name is uh, Mona Kanwal Sheikh, uh, and I will be moderating this next session. Uh, I am currently the head of the Global Security and Worldviews Unit, Research Unit at the Danish Institute for International Studies, uh, and also heading one part of the Danish uh, Afghanistan Commission uh, that is looking into the question about why or how come that the Taliban could take over uh, Afghanistan in spite of the uh, heavy military and civil engagement in the country. So one part of that uh, inquiry uh, is uh, focusing on the lack of attention uh, towards an inclusive peace process. Uh, and though I know that this panel is not uh, about Afghanistan, uh, what unfolded in Afghanistan is an example of a context where there is a desperate need uh, to reconsider uh, both the role of interventions but also uh, the way we are thinking about conflict resolution. Uh, so armed conflicts today, uh, if we look at them very broadly, uh, they are, of course, driven by a range of factors, very different factors. It could be scarce resources, ideology, climate change. Uh, it can be local feuds over land issues. Uh, it can be spillover effects. Um, from rivalries between different regional actors. Um, and, and these uh, factors, scarce resources or climate change and so on, are often um, present at once. They are often a part of the very same conflict. Uh, so that is what our panel will be about today. Uh, it's uh, in the literature on conflict uh, thinking, uh, there are these terms that are called like conflict interlinkages, bundled conflicts, uh, multi-layered conflicts, uh, that all reflect this very growing scholarly attention to uh, such uh, complexity. Uh, and perhaps you could say that these sorts of complexities have al always been there, uh, but I think a growing attention towards the way that these different factors or uh, dynamics are interlinked uh, has implications for the way that we think about uh, conflict transformation or conflict resolution or conflict containment. Uh, so in this panel, we want to demonstrate uh, these forms of conflict constellations uh, that have different layers, and we ask what are the implications for, for the different layers of a conflict. And before I hand the mic to our first uh, panelist, uh, I just want to give one very brief example uh, of why this is relevant. Um, and an, an example of a recent conflict uh, is, for instance, the conflict uh, in Syria. Uh, if we look back at what happened and the development of the events, uh, so we see that the manifestation of the Arab Spring that happened, uh, you know, that, ha that started with this protest against the authoritarian regime in 2011, it quickly turned into this stage for regional rivalry. So it was as a local protest against the authoritarian regime um, changing into a, a stage for regional rivalry. It sparked a full-blown civil war uh, and it caused uh, international or led to international military inter interference. So um, we also saw that a lot of jihadist actors, some locals, other foreigners, uh, came into that conflict arena. Eventually, Islamic State was established as, as a movement and the territorial caliphate there. Uh, and the conflict then became further complicated. And yet, this was not the complication that I'm talking about, was not only due to the fact that there were like multiple actors on ground, 
uh, but it was also assumingly due to some other uh, aspects driving the conflict. And these are, you can call non-material aspects such as ideology, religion, emotions, transnational communication, and so on. So when we talk about these types of interlinked conflicts or bundled conflicts, we do not only mean like conflict extension, that a conflict, it has a spillover effect on the neighboring country. Uh, but we talk about the fact that uh, we might want to challenge the idea that there is an original conflict that we need to deal with that automatically expands or escalates. So the idea is if you have multiple actors on ground, uh, it of course complicates conflict, but it also means that you have a lot of different accounts about what the conflict, conflict is actually about in its core. Uh, and I think we need to ask ourselves, in a conflict situation, do we pay enough attention to these multiple accounts of what the conflict is actually about? Uh, and in this panel, we want to uh, present two types of contemporary conflicts that display this type of complexity that I'm talking about. So the first is conflicts with um, that involve jihadist actors, uh, and the second type is conflicts that are accelerated by climate change. And then we also ask the question about how uh, multipolarity, um, again, a question that relates to a lot of actor types that we need to relate to, how that actually affects our conflict resolution thinking. Uh, I should perhaps also say that a couple of our panelists uh, unfortunately couldn't be here today uh, because uh, due to illness, uh, but we still have this wonderful uh, panel here. Um, and I will present them at once in the beginning here, and then one by one they will come up here and present. And in the end we will open up for questions uh, and answers. Um, and if you're silent at that point, then I will try to provoke some, some, some questions or some comments. Uh, so our three uh, speakers uh, are, we have Dino Krause, who is a postdoc researcher at the Danish Institute for International Studies. His current work is on de-escalation uh, and containment of jihadist conflicts, uh, particularly those with non uh, state groups that are affiliated with Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. Uh, then we have Justine uh, Champers, who is also a postdoctoral uh, research fellow at DEES, at the Danish Institute for International Studies. Uh, and she has extensive research experience from Myanmar uh, with a focus uh, on moral authorities, uh, on violence, conflict ec economies, land use, and climate change. Uh, and then uh, our last panelist, not least, is Isabel Bramsen, uh, who's an associate professor and director of peace and conflict studies at Lund University. Uh, and she conducts research on uh, nonviolent resistance, um, on violence, diplo diplomacy, peace talks, uh, in, in very diverse cases such as Philippines, the, uh, Syria, Colombia, and Northern Ireland, right? So, uh, Welcome to the panel, and, and I hope you will enjoy the presentations. So, Dino, go ahead. Thank you, Mona, for the introduction, and thank you to the organizers for putting together such an inspiring and really interesting conference. I'm really glad uh, for the opportunity to be able to speak about jihadist conflicts today and some of the challenges they pose for, for peace building. In 2023, today, um, over four years after, in March 2019, the Islamic State lost the last pockets of its former self-declared caliphate in eastern Syria, still one-third of the world's civil wars involved groups with a self-proclaimed uh, globally oriented jihadist ideology. Um, 
Most of these groups are affiliated with Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State through a formal pledge of allegiance. And it is those kinds of groups uh, that I'm focusing on in my research, um, which are also somewhat different from nationally oriented Islamist groups such as Hamas, for example. Um, if you look at this map, uh, it's maybe a little bit small, but uh, I hope you can see the global distribution of uh, organized violence involving these groups. Uh, this map is based on data from 2022. It's actually based on data from uh, the Uppsala Conflict Data Program, which was already mentioned yesterday, which is a very useful source. Um, and uh, you can see how the, the epicenter of this kind of conflict has somewhat shifted actually in recent years from North Africa and the Middle East more towards Sub-Saharan Africa and you see the epicenter of that kind of violence today being very much in the Sahel region but also in the Horn of Africa and Somalia and there are also so somewhat younger conflicts uh, with jihadist groups in uh, northeastern Mozambique uh, in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo. And importantly, Islamic State is also still very active in its originally core territory of Iraq and Syria, and also in Afghanistan. It's very important uh, to state up front that when, I, when I'm saying jihadist conflicts, uh, this does not mean that these conflicts are only uh, about jihadism. Um, actually, these are conflicts that are inter interwoven at the local level with various uh, local conflict drivers, uh, such as state repression, uh, state incapacity, um, ethnic tensions, organized crime, um, poverty, of course, and also accelerated by climate change. So um, we will have a separate uh, discussion of that, but if we look, for example, at the Sahel region there, we have the, the overlap of, uh, of both. We have jihadist groups uh, operating in areas that have been already badly affected by, by climate change. Now, although these conflicts are taking place in many different uh, parts of the world, um, and they also resemble uh, non-jihadist conflicts in many ways, there's something that seems quite particular if you separate these conflicts from other types of armed conflicts, and that is that they are basically unavailable for conflict resolution. So we don't have any examples of high-level peace negotiations, let alone peace agreements being signed by, by these kinds of groups um, with affiliations to Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State. And um, these conflicts are also very intensive, so they're causing great human suffering. And this, of course, uh, po poses the question, uh, why? Why are these conflicts so unavailable for, for conflict resolution? So I'm going to focus on that in my uh, short presentation and maybe also as, a, uh, as a, some inf information for you is that what I'm going to say is based on patterns across different conflicts. So, not all of these points may 100% apply in every jihadist conflict, but there are some overall patterns that we can see. I will structure the sets of explanations uh, along two lines. The first one is factors that are related to the jihadist groups themselves. So basically factors um, that render these groups or that may render them uh, unavailable for peace building attempts. And then on the other hand, we have factors that are related to the governments. So why may governments perhaps treat these groups also differently from other uh, insurgent groups and thereby also contributing to the intractability of, these, of this type of conflict? Starting with the jihadists, it's very important to, to state that they have far-ranging goals. Um, and these goals are far-ranging uh, on the one hand in terms of being global. So jihadist groups have uh, an ideology that transcend, transcends nation-state nation borders. In fact, they actually uh, explicitly reject nation-state borders. And this makes it very difficult, of course, uh, also theoretically and practic practically to negotiate about something as abstract as a global caliphate. Um, additionally, even if you look at what they want to achieve domestically, uh, it's quite, um, quite far-ranging. They want to establish uh, their interpretation of Sharia-based law. They want to transform existing state institutions. And this, uh, of course, if it were to be implemented, would come with, gra with grave consequences for different minority groups in society. And it also often directly runs counter to existing uh, constitutions of states that are in conflict with these groups. Another factor is the organizational structure of many jihadist groups, uh, which is, resembles uh, a cell-like organizational structure. So often these groups are operating 
in locally somewhat disconnected units uh, of small numbers of fighters that are commanded by uh, low-level leaders. Um, and that makes them very factionalized. So if governments want to uh, negotiate with them, also, for example, about more limited issues such as prisoner releases, uh, local ceasefires, humanitarian access, it's often difficult to identify the representatives of jihadist groups uh, that can actually speak on behalf of the entire group that have that, uh, who have that authority. And this is also partially a consequence, the structure of the high level of uh, military pressure that they have been exposed to. Uh, so uh, this is also perhaps important to, to keep in mind. Then there's of course the, the affiliations of these groups with external organizations. I already mentioned that the overwhelming majority of uh, jihadist groups operating in different parts of the world are affiliated with Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State. And um, this means that uh, um, a decision to enter peace negotiations theoretically would, of course, also, uh, these organizations would also have a say in it. And this is particularly an issue, I would say, with regards to the Islamic State, because the Islamic State, um, on ideological grounds, one could say, is very hostile towards the, the, the very idea of negotiating and often attacks its rival Al-Qaeda, uh, claiming that Al-Qaeda is um, uh, betraying uh, its, its own ideology by being allegedly open for negotiations. Although, as I said before, we haven't actually seen Al-Qaeda being involved in peace negotiations before. Um, so this is certainly also a major challenge. If we look at the government side of the equation, uh, one very basic challenge is that uh, governments often don't fully acknowledge the, the political dimensions of jihadist conflicts. Uh, these conflicts are often framed in a way where, um, the, where governments actually deny that there is an armed conflict in the first place. They're often presented as terrorist groups um, and uh, that are also presented as religiously fanatic. Um, and therefore outside of the reach for negotiations. And while that may be true with regards to um, several jihadist groups, um, it, is, uh, it may not be true with regards to all of them to the same extent. Jihadist conflicts also are characterized by the involvement often of external actors. Uh, states fighting against jihadist groups have often received external counterterrorism support uh, for example, African Union involvement in Mozambique, uh, French and uh, US and very, various other um, international actors have supported uh, local governments in the Sahel region fighting against jihadists there. Uh, and you also have now a private military company, Wagner, operating uh, in the same area. The challenge with this is, of course, that the higher the number of external actors that become involved in these conflicts, uh, the, the higher also the number of actors becomes that needs to agree on, uh, would have to agree on a negotiation strategy. And given the sensitivity of this issue, um, we, we, we can often see that it's also the external actors that are pushing local governments away from uh, negotiating. Sometimes an example would be Mali, where um, the former president, Keita, I think it was in 2020, uh, signaled actually openness towards uh, exploring uh, the possibility of negotiating with the Al-Qaeda, with parts of the Al-Qaeda affiliated coalition, um, insurgent coalition in Mali. And then there was a public pushback from, from the French government against that. So that I think works also to illustrate uh, this, this challenge. Last point. Um, and this is a, a challenge in many armed conflicts around the world for peace building is the issue of terrorist listings. And this is particularly relevant in jihadist conflicts because jihadist groups are significantly more likely to be terrorist listed than other groups. And this has been documented in different studies. Um, all major Islamic State and Al-Qaeda uh, affiliates are uh, widely proscribed on all major terrorist lists. Now, uh, terrorist listings, of course, serve some important functions. Uh, they can allow uh, governments to prosecute individuals associated with these organizations, uh, for example, to uh, counter their, their financing networks. But when it comes to peace building, uh, it's also a barrier because it establishes uh, legal repercussions for, uh, for example, civil society actors that may want to engage in local level dialogue with these groups or for external peace building actors as well. Um, so um, 
one way to, to address this could, for example, be to uh, make that kind of engagement legal while leaving the terrorist listings in place or to provide uh, avenues towards delisting because listing groups is uh, relatively easy, but delisting them on the long run is quite a big challenge. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that and leave the floor to the next speaker. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone, uh, and thank you especially to Mona for organising this panel and to the organisers here. Um, it's been a really uh, inspiring conference, uh, and I'm from Australia. I'm from the Danish Institute for International Studies, but it's been really great to get a sense for um, the conversations happening in the Nordic region. Um, I uh, will be speaking uh, primarily from my experience working on Myanmar, but I think a lot of the uh, research uh, and the sort of conversations that are taking place in that context also speak to other contexts that I hope um, you can all uh, learn from. So uh, the conflict climate nexus in 2021, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change warned that the impacts of the climate crisis are particularly pronounced in poor and conflict affected countries. Of the 25 countries deemed most vulnerable to climate change, the majority are mired in conflict. Um, environmental degradation made worse by climate change has increased competition between farmers and pastoral herd, um, pastoralist herders in West Africa, access to water along with drought, um, desertification, recurrent flooding um, is causing economic and social fabric of the Horn of Africa and the Sahel region constraints. Um, in other countries, climate change does not directly cause armed conflict, but indirectly increases the risk of conflict by exacerbating existing social and environmental um, inequalities, such as Guinea-Bissau, Myanmar, Somalia, Haiti. Um, this is not to say that there is a direct correlation between climate change and conflict, rather that countries enduring conflict are less able to cope with climate change precisely because their ability to adapt is weakened by conflict. And there is increasing recognition that climate change, environmental degradation and peace and security are intrinsically interlinked and cannot be treated as um, separate issues. Um, however, there are really gaps that remain in how to address this increasing climate change, vulnerabilities in context with, with violent conflict and state oppression. So I think it's really important in thinking about the question of climate change and conflict that we go back to root causes and to history um, rather than sort of seeing these uh, issues as just coming about in the last sort of two decades. Climate security impacts tend to be complex as they often take shame through um, chains of compounded effects. Both conflict and climate change are embedded in complex power structures which co-produce and expose differentiated and unjust life opportunities, insecurities and vulnerabilities. I think it's really interesting that over the last couple of days, no one's mentioned the role of capitalism. And I think when we're talking about climate change, it's really key to question what we take for granted in the global world order. The vulnerability of many countries is not rooted in topography, but in a planned historical process of development within the global capitalist system. Global efforts to reduce emissions also run headlong into land grabbing dynamics and stoke which also stoke insecurity and conflict as they create shifts in access to and control over land-based resources away from local inhabitants who depend on agrarian livelihoods. Um, if we look at global initiatives in biofuels, hydropower, nature conservation and climate adaptation, we're seeing a really big increase in land grabs against, uh, away from agrarian and indigenous communities. Um, so attempting to explain the effects of climate change or create strategies to adapt to and mitigate it without reckoning with these longer term um, transformations in ecology, land and labour risks really normalising and exacerbating um, already stark inequalities and differentiated vulnerabilities. So in terms of the international efforts, we are really seeing an increased sort of, um, you know, conversations building around um, the conflict climate nexus. 
Uh, the UN is seeking to mitigate security risks in tandem with its efforts to address climate change so as to generate co-benefits and create a more resilient future. Uh, since 2018, the climate security mechanism has provided multidisciplinary support to member states, regional organisations and United Nations entities to better understand the linkages be between climate, peace and security. Um, the UN Security Council has adopted over 70 resolutions and presidential statements that address aspects of climate-related peace and security implications. Um, this is included in political and peacekeeping missions. Um, however, a few member states still really strong, uh, still, still strongly oppose adding uh, climate change to the Security Council agenda, despite this sort of broad support among UN member states. In addition, the world's richest countries are conspicuously failing to commit to climate targets um, and generate the international financing needed to tackle climate change and biodiversity loss, uh, further exacerbating insecurity and conflict risk. Um, and there really remains insufficient emphasis on the critical role of sustainable development issues in a package of measures on conflict prevention in particular. Uh, implementing depoliticized climate-related interventions um, from the broader context. So more concerted collective action is really needed to assess the security implications of climate change and its effects on fragile and conflict-affected states, but particularly on the most vulnerable communities, women, youth and Indigenous groups. So I wanted to draw attention to Myanmar, which, um, like many conflicts in the world, is, uh, has basically been forgotten. It's not really in the media anymore. Um, which, you know, as someone who works there, is very devastating. Uh, these dynamics are really heightening countries like Myanmar, where the insecurities posed by a brutal military dictatorship, um, more than 70 years of civil, civil war. Uh, and climate change are deeply embedded within power and intersectional inequalities, as well as longer term struggles over land, territory, indigeneity and belonging. And just for some context, there was a brutal military coup in February 2021, but Myanmar has been at constant conflict since it gained independence in 1948. And as you can imagine, it was also in conflict before that because it was involved in World War II. Uh, it was also, there was an independence movement. So. You know, I think it's really important just to remember history um, when we think about conflict. Um, but I also wanted to sort of take you back to before the coup, before it became the crisis that it currently is. Um, even though a large parts of the country were still in conflict, we saw um, policies being developed with international technical support on climate change. Um, while recognising the urgency of climate change actions, many of the solutions were focused on support through the central government, which has been largely seen as a violent predatory government, and on really techno-managerial solutions, such as modern technological innovations, government regulation and policy change. However, the majority of these policies were by and large apolitical and conflict blind, and we see that in other parts of the world. Uh, we see a lot of climate interventions going into places and not recognising uh, conflict dynamics and the complexities of conflict dynamics. So there was no mention in documents of the armed conflicts in the border regions, agrarian land struggles, and the legacies of ethnic conflict uh, and authoritarianism, let alone a recognition of how these realities on the ground affect um, local climate change adaptation and environmental protection. And the role of civil society and indigenous natural resource protection were largely ignored um, or under-prioritized in favor of state-centric top-down solutions. Since the coup, um, Many sort of uh, international organisations and donors did initially suspend uh, their work on both peace building and climate adaptation uh, and mitigation initiatives. However, we are already seeing a push from uh, the U United Nations organisations for a normalisation uh, of, rela of relations with the military. Meanwhile, human rights abuses and mass atrocities continue to unfold across the country at scale every day. Um, just yesterday, an IDP camp was bombed by the military. Uh, the military has also expanded mining operations, further degrading ecosystems and worsening food security for millions of people. 
plans to revive uh, controversial hydropower dams and palm oil plantations in locations um, which are largely in uh, ethnic and indigenous communities. And the lack of governance, accountability and enforcement of, in, of environmental protection is already having long-term effects on the population and kind of further feeds into the conflict dynamics. And yet, despite these constraints, uh, Indigenous-led coalitions and ethnic community-based organisations do continue to raise their voices for change, um, calling for you know, return of their territories and respect for the environment and the recognition of self-determination. So how do we think about ways forward with these really incredible, complicated and complex uh, dynamics? Um, I think it's really important that humanitarian organisations in conflict spaces uh, collaborate to strengthen climate action. Uh, while people in conflict zones are among the most vulnerable to climate change, we have a lot of data and evidence on that, there is a really big gap in funding for climate action between stable and fragile countries. Um, and a greater share of climate, climate finance really needs to be allocated to places affected by conflict um, to help communities adapt to climate change. Increased cooperation also between multilateral bodies um, to ensure that climate action and peace building reinforce each other and don't actually further degrade um, already these complex conflict dynamics. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the international community really needs to ensure that the drivers of conflict are considered with climate interventions and peace building interventions. Um, uh, but I think also that we need to think more imaginatively in sort of taking the theme of this conference. We need to think outside the bounds of the state system as well. And I think, uh, you know, so many sort of uh, climate interventions but also peace building forums are so focused on state actors. And going back to some of the conversations from yesterday, a lot of these actors are men and also perpetrators of violence. And you know, there are so many community groups that are tired of not having a seat at the table. And, you know, the implementation should really shift away from these sort of top-down state-centric and purely technical solutions to people-centred approaches with flexible funding and reporting requirements in conflict zones um, that really sort of fit these volatile and insecure contexts. Um, and again, instead of being constrained by state-based solutions, Climate security should really target assistance at local CSOs, indigenous groups and women's organisations um, outside of the state. You know, where are the women, those who are most affected by the conflict? Why are they not at these tables? Where are the indigenous groups? Why are they not, um, you know, at the, at the conversations around climate change? Why are they constantly outside of these rooms? Uh, when we seek solutions, Without those most impacted by conflict and climate change, uh, we won't find solutions. Um, and we really need people that have actually demonstrated their commitment to peace and to environmental peace building at the table, rather than sort of just facilitating the role of authoritarian military perpetrators of violence. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you very much to the organizers for this fantastic conference. Super inspiring and very, very important uh, in these days. And also thank you very much to Mona for putting this excellent uh, panel together. Uh, the previous speakers have been touching upon um, sort of the difficulties of today's uh, conflicts, the unavailability uh, of, uh, of uh, <clears throat> some of the conflicts to be solved, the difficulties uh, very much focusing on sort of the characteristics of the new trends of the conflict. And I will, I will look more into sort of uh, the characteristics of today's world in making conflict resolution um, more uh, difficult or at least uh, different. And I want to um, draw your attention to sort of the multipolarity, increasing multipolarity 
of the world, there is a, a big discussions in peace research and IR whether we are seeing uh, multipolarity or not. Uh, but certainly, uh, most analysts agree that we see a decline in unipolarity in sort of US hegemony and uh, sort of increasing importance of regional uh, actors uh, and rising powers. So, in this sort of world of, of multipolarity and of sort of uh, power rivalry and geopolitical competition, there is indeed a greater importance of uh, diplomacy. And uh, yesterday, the new uh, agenda for peace uh, from the General Secretary of the UN was mentioned. And here uh, in that agenda, really, diplomacy is put at the core of sort of avoiding uh, geopolitical competition from, from turning violent. And so certainly there's a greater need for diplomacy uh, and you could say in this new emerging world order it's more important to have many friends, for example voting with you in the UN Security Council or General Assembly, uh, also the importance of more flexible alliances and so on. So I think there are many new interesting changes um, in the world order today and uh, when it comes to uh, mediation and conflict resolution we see a change in mediators, we see a change in parties, uh, and in terms of possible solutions. Uh, and when it comes to mediators, uh, there are certainly new actors of uh, mediation. Um, one thing is, is uh, multi-party mediation, where, uh, and this relates to the whole conversation about the Nordics as well, uh, Nordics teaming up uh, with, uh, with other partners like Norway and Cuba, uh, who were the main guarantors of the peace talks uh, between the Colombian government and the FARC. Uh, and now, recently ongoing, we have peace talks between the LN, uh, another um, uh, militant group in Colombia uh, with uh, the Colombian government. And here we also have Norway and Cuba, but also Venezuela. And these talks, uh, and I, I would be, <laughs> love to maybe talk to you, Dino, about how, I mean, at, at least it's very interesting that some of these talks actually very much take into account the complexities of the conflict and the many different groups and interests. And there's a new uh, peace plan in, in Colombia, Paz Total, where they're bringing all kinds of militant groups, also just criminal groups and all kinds of groups uh, uh, to talk. So I think there are some very interesting uh, dynamics there that might be uh, uh, also applicable in jihadist conflicts, but maybe not. <laughs> uh, but it could be an interesting discussion. Um, but then we also see uh, entrance of mediators with sort of non-liberal uh, values, uh, uh, with sort of China, Saudi Arabia, uh, this year uh, sort of uh, uh, mediating, uh, if you will, uh, uh, an agreement, uh, sort of detente agreement between Saudi Arabia and, uh, and Iran, uh, Turkey in the case of Ukraine last year, uh, Russia, Nagorno-Karabakh and Syria and elsewhere. So we certainly see new actors, not uh, the sort of Nordics or, uh, you know, <laughs> as we know them with liberal values and so on, uh, but, but very different actors. Um, uh, and um, in the case of Ukraine, uh, I think it's a, it's a good case in point to see, uh, you know, these different actors uh, being involved in, in the peace, uh, you know, attempts to, to end the war. Uh, you could ask, is this one of the most uh, diplomatic efforts in, in the sort of, um, in history to end the war? At least we have numerous countries uh, offering their assistance to mediation. Turkey, South Africa, China, Israel, all kinds of countries uh, saying, well, we can mediate uh, uh, if you want. Uh, so, so that is certainly an interesting development, I think. Um, and also there's been a trend of offering peace plans uh, uh, and or position papers on peace with African countries traveling to uh, Russia and Ukraine to come with a, their idea uh, for sort of a framework for peace and China coming up with a peace plan, Ukraine having a, a sort of peace, a peace uh, plan. Uh, so, so that is very interesting. And then uh, I wanted to flag meetings uh, that were held this year, first in June in Copenhagen and then later in Jeddah uh, in Saudi Arabia in, in August. Um, where there was a peace summit uh, of a kind without Russia. So 40 countries gathered uh, their sort of 
security advisors uh, to talk about the Ukrainian uh, peace plan. Uh, and even uh, in Jeddah, uh, Saudi Arabia managed to get China on board. So sort of a, a track of peace negotiations without the main party uh, on board. I mean, if you open any book on conflict resolution or mediation, it will say you, you need the parties <laughs> to the conflict at the table. But I, I, I'm not to say that maybe this could actually be a fruitful uh, track to actually draw, s pull some strings and, and come up, uh, you know, with uh, you know, <laughs> China being allied to Russia and so on, pull some strings to actually maybe come up with a framework for future negotiations. Uh, who knows? And at least nobody knows, apart from the people in the room, what actually happened in, in these settings. So I think that sort of raises the questions, is this new multipolarity with so many actors uh, being uh, involved, good or bad for country resolution? And I guess there's no clear answer to that. Um, some uh, could argue that there are greater chances for resolving at least some types of uh, conflict. For example, Iran and Saudi Arabia, uh, you wouldn't necessarily have had the US negotiating uh, uh, some kind of deal in that uh, regard. Uh, so maybe with more parties sort of offering their assistance, maybe there's a greater chance for uh, finding solutions. Uh, but uh, definitely it can also be uh, discussed, you know, the legitimacy of, of many of these processes. Uh, and you could say that uh, to some, I mean, it's quite tricky because to some extent, peace process of, of this kind of new actors being mediators are more inclusive. Uh, uh, and in, to some extent, they're less inclusive. So one example is the Astana peace talks, uh, uh, sort of Syrian uh, peace talks uh, or peace talks on Syria, which was parallel to the UN track uh, uh, in Geneva. Uh, starting 2017. And here, uh, interestingly, Iran was on board and they were not invited to the table uh, in the UN-led peace talks, uh, but also uh, because Turkey, so it was Turkey, Russia and Iran uh, sort of convening um, or being the guarantors of the Astana uh, peace uh, process track. Uh, and since Turkey was on board as one of the guarantors, they would sort of uh, prevent uh, Kurdish groups uh, from, from being part of the talks and, and certainly women and civil society representatives. So to some extent, uh, uh, these processes are more inclusive uh, and, and to some extent they're less inclusive. And certainly you could say they're less focused on liberal values and you can have more sort of a, uh, a smaller uh, peace agreements with less focus on uh, sort of justice and uh, democracy and so on, uh, but more just uh, ceasefire agreements or, or something of the like. And definitely, uh, and, and we should keep, <laughs> I mean, it's tricky to always say that something is complex and, and muddy, but certainly it makes conflict resolution processes uh, even more uh, complex and muddy. Uh, and I think I also wanted to sort of just flag quickly uh, what form of multipolarity, if we were to like zoom out, okay, what kind of world do we want? Uh, uh, this is the imagined form, so I think it, it fits, you know, if we have increasing uh, sort of importance of regional powers and so on, uh, how can we prevent uh, sort of a major uh, wars? Um, and some uh, scholars, analysts say we need a cooperative multipolarity. Others uh, like Kissinger would say we need, you know, emphasizing the importance of shared values and mutual trust. Uh, but I think it's important to recognize that friendly relations and cooperation is not always possible. It's not always, you know, uh, just um, <clears throat> possible to have uh, cooperation across, uh, uh, you know, different devices and so on. Uh, so, uh, especially also when there is increasing uh, resistance to liberal norms, uh, the liberal world order and to US hegemony in particular. Uh, so I just want to flag an idea that I'm uh, working on at the moment, uh, sort of an alternative to, to this, to have an agonistic world order, agonic, agonistic diplomacy, uh, and I, it relates to what Marco also mentioned yesterday with the idea of agonistic peace, so rather than having peace as like now we're all friends and happy and so on, to have peace as sort of a space for contestation, counter-hegemony, diversity, pluralism and so on, not necessarily solve the issues, of course, you know, we need to solve many issues. There are many things uh, that we need to have immediate action on, 
but there are also many things that are very, very difficult uh, to, to solve and has to do with values and so on, uh, that maybe we shouldn't solve them immediately. It, it's not main focus on consensus, but more on being able to continue the conversation and not sort of close down diplomatic space when it's most uh, needed. Um, so having this continued in action uh, in the UN and elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, just go up here. Um, I think we have time for a couple of uh, questions or comment from, comments from the audience. Uh, and yeah, and you can perhaps present yourself and then who you're targeting your question at. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for an amazing panel, very interesting. Uh, I have um, questions for two of the speakers. Uh, so if I may turn to uh, Isabel, who presented last. Um, so if, if you could reflect on the use uh, of the, the term liberal values and the trap that this actually could create in terms of um, underscoring the importance of the universality of human rights that we have been talking about. Um, second question, um, I would like to direct to you Dino, and it has to do with, uh, with the groups and that, that you talked about, uh, who may be you know, start, uh, local in nature, fighting local grievances and injustices, but who then sort of jump on this uh, jihadist bandwagon, which may be very useful for fighting purposes. They get resources and other forms of um, military support, but if they then want to negotiate, you know, they're in a trap. Uh, their cell-like structures don't allow for it, and their external patrons won't allow it. So um, my question to you is, like, do you see any opportunities for these groups to relocalize again? Uh, if there's any research on that, and also another question, if what, what types of third parties are, seem most effective when it comes to engaging with these groups. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can we take one more question and then I'll, I'll uh, give the word to the panel because I can see we actually need to end the session soon. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, thank you. This is more or less a comment for Isabel and like a, like a question I think that you provoked in the end. And I very much agree that I, I think we needed a kind of a new kind of a agonistic multilateralism that, uh, that we can prevent the, perhaps a major force, but what it could be, that, that is a, another issue and how it come up. But I would like to kind of focus a bit the same amount how, how you perhaps emphasize the, the kind of uh, uh, how the illiberal or authoritarian powers that are becoming mediators may not, or certainly not kind of uh, uh, promote the liberal values. I would have seen this a bit differently, and I make the question in, in that way that, that see, see that uh, uh, first, uh, uh, I think that how the mediation field has been changed uh, uh, during the past decade, to see that it's called far beyond the promoting of liberal values. So we have a media mediator field, we're looking about not only state actors, but a lot of a kind of a private kind of NGO actors and non-profit actors that have stepped beyond the promoting any kind of liberal values for very much of Trump looking for a kind of a local inclusive solution and, and a kind of engaging this kind of inclusive and don't care, even not think about in what direction that the solution and the peace would go off. They're leaving that really to, to take kind of a coming, peace coming from bottom up. Uh, uh, and I think when the danger with, with that kind of a bringing authoritarian and liberal powers in, into the kind of a mediation field is that they bring also an alternative, not alternate the different norms, but also alternate vision of the peace. And they, they are, it's not uniform, but I can talk about authoritarian uh, conflict management form or authoritarian peace, which is very ca different kind of than, than perhaps we have to talk about here. It's very state-centric, very controlled, very much a kind of a excluding all kind of a, uh, opponent voices and marginal voices. And, and, and I think there is a danger if you're leaving these illiberal powers because it's, for them it's also came. 
to gain a kind of a position in international order. I know that they can do that nicely with uh, China, with uh, Iran and, and Saudi Arabia, but there's also danger that we're losing this inclusivity, which we have already developed a practice very much because a lot of, uh, there are a lot of uh, not only Western-based, but also global actors doing the mediators and all this. This is seemingly be in danger. But I think there's uh, two different things, the multilateral, agonistic multilateralism and this kind of uh, medi authoritarian mediators. In thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, uh, time flies, uh, so we don't have actually uh, a lot of time for taking more questions, so I will actually urge you to uh, have a chat with the panelists afterwards, but I'll just give the word back to the panelists so you can comment on the already asked uh, questions and, and comments. Even if it's a two-finger? Uh, two-finger. Uh, is it a very short two-finger? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Just okay. to remind our previous commentator that the most illiberal uh, negotiation that just happened was with the United States and handing over the, to the Taliban. So this has got nothing to do with those other countries. It's actually supposedly the purveyors of democracy that are doing this. And some of the most inclusive processes were led, for example, in Yemen by uh, Moroccan mediators. So the notion that um, the Nordics or somehow European, uh, North American, supposedly democratic states are doing liberal, liberal versions of negotiations and anybody from the rest of the world is doing illiberal ones is really false. Even in the case of Colombia, it was because of the push from global movements and Colombian movements that we ended up with a much more inclusive process. So let's just be very, very careful about, about how we uh, divide this notion of who, who is liberal, who's not, and what kind of um, peace we end up with, because the Taliban is really not a great example that we have in front of us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I will actually just uh, leave the moderator role to Pia, because I have to run. Uh, so you will have the chance to slowly comment on the question, so thank you very much. And Pia, here you go. <laughs> Mona is actually on her way to the airport and we don't <laughs> want her to miss the plane. But please, very short answers if you can. Sure. Go ahead. Start. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for these really insightful uh, comments, and thank you, Mona, for <laughs> organizing uh, so far. So I, I, I'm just so, ha so happy, uh, Sanam, that you, will, you know, were allowed to give this two finger because I think it's critical. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the uh, peace agreement, which is not even a peace agreement in Afghanistan, is the worst in history. I mean, it's not even a peace agreement; it's more like a surrendering a agreement or like a <laughs> um, withdrawal agreement. Uh, and for sure, Colombia. One thing is uh, the. The, the talks with the FARC, but now the talks with the ELN, I mean, can you imagine? It's the government, they have like a conflict uh, with the ELN on how participatory the peace talks can be. The first year of the talks has just been about how can we make it more participatory, not even inclusive, it's not in having the parties, you know, different civil society women on board, it's participation that they really emphasize. So for sure, it's not, and, and I think that also relates uh, to, <laughs> to the, the question of, you know, this is universal uh, universality, it's, it's, it's women, it's <laughs> civilians and so on, so it's not just about liberal uh, values for sure. Uh, so I didn't mean to make uh, that kind of uh, <laughs> uh, sort of, uh, you know, distinction uh, in that way, uh, but thank you very much for excellent uh, comments. Christine, you want to respond in some way? Any of the last questions? No, Dino? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I'll respond to Yanni for you had two questions. First one, can these groups relocalize? I think there's one big example of it. It's Hayat Tahrir al-Sham in Syria, which was affiliated with Al-Qaeda and then uh, broke uh, that affiliation and sort of re -and became an independent actor again. And that was a major affiliate. So that shows that it's possible. Um, as to the second question, um, which third parties are most successful in these cases, since there is basically an absence of high-level peace negotiations, we just don't know. Uh, if you look more on what has happened on the local level, uh, I think what's very important is that these have to be actors that, of course, the jihadists need to see as legitimate. So I, I would be somewhat skeptical towards the, the ability there of outside uh, Western actors 
to be successful just because jihadists often seen them as part of a Western conspiracy against themselves, basically. So I think religious legitimacy is important. It can also be on the local level, sometimes tribal uh, actors um, that have uh, mediated in local level conflicts and they were successful to some extent. Um, but uh, it's hard to give a definitive answer because on uh, track one level peace negotiations, we just have no, no evidence actually to, yeah. Well, this is all the time we have for this. Sorry, we lost Mona there at the end. But thank you to our excellent panelists.